Welcome back to Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast, where life, sports, and medicine intersect. We're very glad that you continue to support this podcast. You can get the information on any platform uh, where podcasts are played, as well as getting the video content on YouTube. But if you want to just get one place to find all the content, go to my website at drgarrettbsportsdoctor.com and you will find everything on that website. So without further ado, let's get into this episode. All right, so welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast. And once again, we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Cecily Dowdell-Smith, uh, who is a Peds neurologist at Wellstar in Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So over the last year or so, Dr. Cecily has really grown with her social media presence and really sharing a lot of helpful information for not only her patients, but for the community in general about Peds neurology and about things that kids encounter. And, you know, not always just from an educational standpoint, but sometimes even poking fun at how we interact with patients and things of that nature. So really, you do a great job of keeping it interesting. And thank, thank you. you for the work that you're doing. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I just uh, 13 months ago decided that for whatever reason, I was going to get onto social media, never had a any of my space, YouTube, whatever, all the other ones. And I just, you know, said, maybe I have a voice or maybe I have things that other people want to hear. So I decided to go ahead and post something and took it from there. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think, you know, when I started a podcast now, I'm about two and a quarter years in, I was looking around at who looked like me, who was not mm-hmm. only a, a black physician, but also a surgeon or you know, a doctor and a specialty that are doing things of this nature. And there wasn't a whole lot of people. Now, there's more and more over time. Uh, Dr. Nee Darko was one of my first mentors. He's a trauma surgeon with a podcast. I've come across a couple of other surgeons with podcasts, but it's still very few doctors on social media other than just posting really about yourselves, posting educational content. So it's really needed because people are going to look at social media and people are going to take advice from TikTok, social media, Google, wherever it is. So mm-hmm. the more we can have online for people to access, I think the better. Our Absolutely. Patients. Yeah. And I think that representation, when and you probably hear it a lot just with your patients. I had I had a patient today that the father just thanked me for being, you know, that his daughter, a young black girl could see a, a black female physician. And so I think even hearing that day to day and realizing that that could matter if we are uh, in social media definitely is important. Sure, sure. So, you know, speak about your backstories to what led you to medicine, number one, and what led you to want to be a neurologist? Sure. So I was not a child that knew my whole life that I was going to be a doctor at all. It was just kind of, I don't know, whatever I wanted to do at that time, play tennis, work at Foot Locker, do all sorts of other things, Uh, but was interested, you know, in science and things like that. I actually think I wanted to be a lawyer, but didn't like public speaking. So I ruled that out for whatever reason. So then went to college and did a pre-med major, or they didn't have a pre-med major. I did an economics major, actually, and then kind of did all the pre-med requirements. And I went to college fairly early. I was 16 when I went. Um, and finished in three years. So I was 19 when I graduated, um, but had all the requirements. And then kind of my parents were great in terms of just letting me chart my own path. So took a year off from that just to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. I was a basketball referee. I worked at a ski shop. I worked at Banana Republic, you know, just working and and doing whatever. And then I think I finally, okay, you know, I want to go ahead and go to medical school, but definitely wasn't, I didn't even know a pediatric neurologist was a thing. I'd never been to one, you know, that wasn't even in my mind. It was like, I'm going to go to med school and see if it serves me correctly. Um, And so went there. And as we went through all the different systems, you know how we go through and some things I was like, that's not it. That's not it. You know, that that's not it. And then when we got to the nervous system, that really clicked with me. And there were others that that kind of wasn't their thing. But even learning about it, something just kind of triggered something in me where it really was interesting to me. And then when we started doing our rotations, the neuro- adult neurology rotation, when I got to that, I loved it. I was like, this is everything that I was learning about. I really, really like this. And so that's what I thought that I was going to do was just adult neurology. But what happened was when I was doing my pediatrics rotation, they said, well, you can spend three days in a clinic of your choice. So I said, OK, well, I'll just is there a pediatric is there a neurologist here that does pediatrics? And they said, sure. So I went and spent three days with them. And it was like 
a light bulb moment. It was like this, this, I like neurology. I came to do this and this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. So it was towards the latter part of my medical school journey. I'm glad that I, you know, took time to find exactly what I wanted to do. And and I love it. I would, I would not, not rather be doing anything else. Yeah. So I like the fact that you went into med school, not really knowing, and then mm-hmm. you kind of waited until you got exposed before you chose a path. You know, I said I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon from high school, and it just worked out that way. We know that mm-hmm. that doesn't really happen many times. Most people come in and say, I don't know, or they come in and say, I want to do this, and then they get to the clinical rotations and absolutely hate it. So um, I think yes. I want people to hear that you don't have to know. I tell kids all the time, the main thing you have to take care of right now is making sure you make good grades mm-hmm. and learn how to be a good student. The rest of the things, if you do those things and you have good MCAT or, I mean, excuse me, ACT, SAT scores, the doors are open. And you can, once you get to college or you get into the coursework and sometimes you can have to navigate like that, or you might even start a career and say, this is not it. Mm -hmm. If you have good grades, you're going to be able to pivot and you're going to have options. Um, but exactly. If you don't have the grades early on. That's when you don't usually have the options. So yes, that's what I tell the kids. I say, right now, your school that's your work. So treat that like a job yeah. and kind of do that well. And then yes, the doors will definitely open. Yeah. And then another thing you said, you went to college um, at sixteen, right? So correct. Finished mm-hmm. college three years, so you're nineteen years old. Mm-hmm. You're ready to pretty much enter to professional school. So at first, I was thinking you must have done like the BSMD track, but it's very interesting to hear that your parents allowed you to just soul search, find yourself, whatever. Many times I have, not athletes, but athletes sometimes or students come to me and say, you know, so many people now graduate with a lot of high school credits. So they're going to school as a a sophomore or a junior. Mm. And then two or three years still trying to find themselves. And they say, hey, should I stay another year? What should I do? And from a cultural standpoint, I know... What I <laughs> it's usually keep your head down, keep going. You know, if you step, step, take a step away from school, something's going to happen. You know, you're going to yeah. get married, fall in love, get a job. I right. want to go back. But your parents allowed you to really just search for yourself and let you decide on your own. So I think that's really impressive. Yeah. And there's, there's three girls. So it's me and I have two sisters and we all have taken very different paths. And so they were very good in, you know, nobody wanted me to be a doctor or, you know, there was none of that. It's kind of, you know, they stressed just doing your best at whatever it was. So whatever that may be, you know, if you're a basketball referee, just do your best. If you're going to med school, do your best, you know? And so there was no kind of extra weight given to doing, doing anything in particular, which was, which was very freeing. Yeah, no, I like that. And also, you mentioned your career as a peds neurologist. So, for the people that are listening that are not in the medical field or maybe even in the medical field, let us know what your specialty focuses on. So, I take care of kids from birth to 18 or a little bit after 18 years old. And so, it's not anything that involves surgery. So, a lot of people think, think of peds neurologist as surgery. That would be a neurosurgeon. But I, the top three things that I see would be headaches. Um, And there's bunches of different types of headaches that we cover, um, seizures or epilepsy. And then if you hear of things like tics or Tourette syndrome, developmental delays, any kind of neuropathies, a lot of our specialty is we don't know what this is. So we're going to send them to neurology and then we we might be there to figure it out, tremors. And so those would be some of the more common things that I see patients for. But certainly some of them are outside of the box, genetic conditions, things of that nature. All right. I'm sure another big topic, ADHD. Do you see a lot of mm-hmm. patients with ADHD or is that? So it, typically it depends on where you practice. So when I was a private practitioner in the community, I would do that along with ADHD. Um, during my time in academic medicine, we really focus on the solely neurologic conditions. And so ADHD is kind of a crossover with that. And here it's either pediatricians or psychologists, psychiatrists that tend to manage it. But there is a lot of overlap in the things that I see with ADHD um, and other things as well. When you talk about anxieties and all of those things, some of them tend to run together. So we see it or I see it with a lot of my patients. Got it. Got it. All right. So let's talk about your social media path, so to speak. Mm -hmm. What did you have to overcome? I know you had the knowledge. You know, you've been in practice for 10, 12 years. We have the knowledge, but it's a totally different thing to take a step out and actually talk about it. You know, it's one thing to have, we have these discussions with parents and patients all the time, 
but to get behind a camera and to make it interesting or to just put yourself out there, what things did you have to overcome or what mental obstacles did you have to overcome? So I, uh, tradi- I was gonna say traditionally well, for life, just, and I mentioned it before, mm-hmm. do not like public speaking. So I'm fine in a room with my patients and a few parents yeah. and family members, but having to, you know, in residency, go up and give those presentations in the grand rounds, grand rounds right. just, you know, had to do it, but a mess, like nauseous, you know, all of that. So I think, you know, realizing I have a message and maybe just like going to give a lecture was not a starting point for that, um, but still wanting to share it. So I think that was part of it, just hearing so much in clinic where people are like, gosh, I wish I had I had heard this, or I wish I had known that, or this is really great to hear, or great to see you. And just thinking maybe there, you know, maybe there's a couple other people that might want to hear this or hear my message or even just see me. And you know, I don't have anything to lose. I don't have like a you know, social media represent, you know, and either, I don't think it was going to go horribly, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe nobody cared. So, you know, I wasn't, you know, the fear of failure wasn't there because I wasn't doing it to begin with, you know, so it either was like nobody cared or people cared either way, you know, that was fine. I was still kind yeah. of serving the community that I serve in the office. So, yeah. And what way have, would you say has changed your practice that you might have not even thought about before starting? Well, I think, you know, it just makes you reflect a lot of things that happen in practice that people comment back about not knowing. And you, I think sometimes you get so caught up in the day to day, you think that people know this stuff and the stuff that, you know, you're talking to patients about and people just don't know, or they've never heard it, but getting that feedback from people, then you're like, oh, you know, a lot of my ideas, it's like, I talked about some about it in clinic. And then people were like, I wish I would have known that. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe other people want to know that. Maybe other people want to know a whole series about vitamin D, you know, and then they, and then that people send me questions. And so I think it's just made me more mindful that there's a whole world out there outside of my patients and they may benefit from knowing these things as well. And I think this is more to empower medical providers or to empower doctors, because like you mentioned, there's so many things we take for granted, Mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're in a community and you're talking to physicians. But when you're talking to patients or parents, there's a huge jump, especially there's a leap just to medicine in general. But when you start talking about the brain or start talking about neurological conditions, I'm sure you get blank stares many times. And in your specialty, there's a lot of parent forums that people will join up just to try to get information or to try to connect with somebody that might be dealing with that same condition. So what you're doing on social media allows people in mass to you know, ask questions or comment. I'm sure a lot of the posts that you put up, you receive a lot of feedback on, uh, especially Absolutely. when you're talking about topics that people are, you know, not either really charged about or that they don't know a whole lot about. So it's educational either way. So yes, absolutely. I just want to empower doctors to know that it doesn't have to be something grand. You can do a 30 second talk or 30 second read an article and share or mm-hmm. review an article or something of that nature, small tidbits, because most people don't sit down and listen to a whole podcast or sit down and read a whole article about a neurological condition. But if you can mm-hmm. just give them a little bit, they can at least start there and learn more. Mm-hmm. And I've done exactly that. Just something's come across like a news feed. And I'm like, no, one, well, not no one's going to read this, but a, a majority of people aren't going to sit and read this. Let me just, you know, put it on the green screen and talk about it really quickly. And then you get just a lot of feedback from people. And it's really interesting. And then they to, you know, to other people who are practicing, they'll give you ideas too. I get people all the time. Can you touch on this? Can you touch on this? You know, not asking specific questions, but just topics and you know, if one person asks, then there's likely other people that have the same question. Yeah. And did you have any special training in social media or videography or anything of that nature? I'm the least, you see these falling out every second. I'm the least. So this is what happened last September or August, whenever I started, I didn't even know how to put a my name, like a handle. There was somebody who was volunteering in my clinic, volunteering. And I was like, how do I put this? You know, so no, never have posted anything on social media. You know, it's me and my iPhone. My husband hung a little thing up here for me that says today's the beginning of the first, you know, a little nice saying and, and off I went. But like I said, it was, it was zero expectations. You know, it was just kind of I'll do my best, which again, kind of goes back to my childhood. Like, you know, I did my best and we'll, we'll see what happens, but no, I don't own anything fancy videography wise. I got the phone and I did get a light. 
So there that that was that was that was my I read up about that, you know, some lighting, but but definitely no training. But I think I've actually heard from people. I love the I love the videos where they're very like videography and all the fancy stuff. I think they're great and I can learn a lot. But also people have said, you know, it's authentic. There's, you know, I'll put some music to some things, too. But it's just kind of like me and my phone and whatever comes out. Yeah. So what have you found to really work? Because your page has literally exploded over like the last <laughs> couple months or so. It has. I try to do, I try to be really purposeful about education. There's that part. But I realize some people sometimes just want to laugh. And I think that's also a reflection of my clinic as well. I we're, I see people for serious things. No one is happy about bringing their child to neurologist. But when I tell you we get in trouble every day for having too much fun for like the service down the hall is like, can you please quiet down? We have so much fun. My patients, you know, my parent, the parents are like, you're the one doctor they want to come to. And so I try to, again, make that a reflection of my life. I'm not making fun of anything or things like that. I know some people are, this is a serious, I, you know, I get all of that, but we, ha I have fun in my clinic all the time. And so I do try to be purposeful about, like you said, about bringing that to my page. So it, it gives it just a little bit of, you know, it lightens it up a little bit. Um, and then just a little peek into my life, not too much, but a little, because I think people knowing, like, I personally don't need you to be just known as a doctor. You know, I want people to know that there are other parts of my life that are equally, if not more important. And so, you know, this last month, it's been all about Beyonce. So <laughs> that, that was my life. Like, you might learn about a headache, but you also might right. see me at a Beyonce concert, you know, because that that was my balance for, you know, right. three times. Right. Um, so I think seeing that, again, that's part of the representation. You hear the stories like you're not going to have balance or this is what your life is going to be like or you know and, and parts of it uh, you are leaning in and you can't do that but I think I had a mentor that showed me kind of over the hump that all that's possible is possible and so I would love to be able to show other people that like I live a pretty good life outside of medicine that's uh, definitely possible. <laughs> If you're enjoying this episode, don't wait to the end to share it. Share it now. Share this with a friend or a colleague that you think might find value in this information. And then also make sure that you click and leave us a five-star review and give us feedback because we really value your feedback and your input. Now back to the episode. Yeah. So you mentioned balance. So let's head down that path. So mm -hmm. you're a wife, a mom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you said, you like things outside of medicine. So speak about that balance of being not only a wife, physician, sports mom, things of that nature. So I, I will say, I remember, um, gosh, was I finishing up med school? I can't remember. I was talking to my dad who is like my model of all men and passed away last year who worked so hard, but from what I can remember, never missed any in recital, he was always, always present everywhere. And so I was mentioning like, yeah, whatever, whatever job I want, I want to have balance. And he's like, work life balance, not possible. And I was like, okay, bet. Like, <laughs> okay. You know, so that's kind of been my thing from there and realizing that balance is different depending on what stage I'm at in my life. Sure. And, you know, so when I first came out of training, you know, just got gotten married, we didn't have any kids, we were young. So I was in a private practice and working all the time, but you know, that's fine. You know, I went that, that served me well at that moment. And so that was that. And then, you know, had the first kid and I was like, yeah, you know, now this is, this is not serving me well. So I, you know, whatever, maybe it was 90, 10 at that point work and life, but at that point I needed to kind of cut back. So went to an academic position part-time. So it was only there three days a week. And then while I was there, had another child. And so that for those six years, that's what I needed to not feel overwhelmed and to feel like I was giving as much in both places as I needed. As they got older, I think I was like, I think, I think I can put in like a little bit more to work. And so this opportunity that I met came up here. They asked me to come and start a new uh, division at a growing hospital system. Great opportunity to come and be a leader. My kids were a little bit older. And so this was my balance now. And I think surrounding myself with people who don't have the expectation that my balance equals one thing in life, because that can be different tomorrow than it is today. Right. And I've been really lucky just to have a husband and kids that are, you know, support whatever, it, you know, and I think hopefully I do that for them as well well, kind of whatever they need to feel balanced. And our life is crazy. You know, we 
uh, the weekends, mm-hmm. it's year round sports, year round one basketball, year round one's gymnastics. We've been to junior Olympics for track, you know, we're doing stuff all the time. And so it might not seem balanced to some people right now what we're doing because I mean, it's all the time, but that also means, you know, date night, we might be out till two, 3 a.m. You know, we know we got to get up at at 6 a.m. And that, you know, that, that, you know, my mom said work hard, play hard. And I, you know, even when I went out to college at 16, like you get your work done and you go out and have fun. And so that's, you know, we have different stages in life. So I think, Again, I've been able to do that because the people around me have allowed me to do that and to change what balance means for me. Yeah, I think what you mentioned, number one, you have to be dynamic. It's a fluid situation. Um, You know, we choose medicine at such an early age and we think it's going to look one way. But you enter medicine usually with either early family or no family at all. And you have to adjust around that as you your practice matures and your family matures. So Mm -hmm. it's a, a juggling act. But as you mentioned, priorities, where you put your priorities and how you balance your time, it's going to change. But you have to just focus on whatever is the priority at that time. Mm -hmm. So and then also our children, you know, I have three children as well. And it's always something going on. So, you know, sometimes you feel like, okay, am I giving them enough time or am I able to be present? You know, you can't be there for every practice. I'm sure your kids I had kids in private schools at one time and they wanted you to be there for practice and the event. And I, my daughter still reminds me four years ago, yeah. I missed a, a ballet practice at pre, yeah. pre-K. So yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, I, I explain, I always have said from the beginning, like you're, you're I'll be there when I can, you know, I go for career day. I go when I can, when I have time. And, you know, I think they're at the point yeah. where they, yeah. they know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some pediatric neurological topics. You know, I know that we're in, Sports season, soccer, football, so concussions is always a big thing. Concussions is always a hot topic because even in professional sports, you know, now we're learning more about CTE and long term. But mm-hmm. concussion, the effects, long term effects are additive. So many times I deal with college athletes and, you know, they have a concussion and you get ask about a history and they're like, oh, yeah, I had three or four before. And it's almost like, oh, yeah, whatever. I got over it. Mm-hmm. That's done. But speak about you know, a concussion on a young brain, how it differs from an adult, as well as the additive effect of concussions over time. Sure. So, and I think a really important thing is that a lot of times the patients and the parents that I see, maybe that aren't in, let's say they're not in contact sports and they haven't heard a lot about concussions. They think that to have a concussion, you're going to present a certain way. You know, you're going to have lost consciousness and have a bad headache you know, that's the box of concussion. And maybe they don't think about the mood changes and the appetite changes and difficulty concentrating and, you know, all of those things, the dizziness that can go along with it. And maybe if you have some of those symptoms in absence of a headache, they don't even realize that they've had a concussion, right? So to your point about maybe my kids in contact sports asking about a history of those, oh, well, yeah, I had this one, you know, and I was dizzy for a couple, but eh, nobody ever thought about it. And so I really take that time when even when we know they've had a concussion to teach kids to advocate for themselves when they have symptoms you know I always say we can see if you're laid out on the field and not responsive everybody can see that but if you you know got hit and now can't remember the last play and you know maybe we we can't see that you know or if you just have a headache we can't see that and so I think coaches are doing a lot better job now of also being mindful of you know kids self-reporting versus just like Go, the go back in their attitude. And so there's a lot of pre-testing that they do and just being mindful and trying to get them in quickly. I use a lot of concussion therapy. I love sending kids to, um, you know, a lot of my concussion patients will have dizziness as a, a huge symptom that's really hard. So I'll send them to vestibular physical therapy to help with that. It's hard to recover. Most children that I see have not had many concussions. Right. And so- Some have, you know, it's a little bit different, but I usually will say, you know, if we can really work on, it's hard to rest your brain. So it's it's really hard to rest your brain. You know, if you sprain your ankle and we wrap it up and put you on a little scooter and, you know, off you go till it's better, but it's really hard for any of us to do what's needed to kind of recover. But if they can kind of lean into that, then usually they'll end up doing better. We don't have to do a lot of things. Sometimes it is hard. Sometimes I do have athletes that have had multiple concussions. And then maybe on top of that, they have a history 
of migraine headaches, right? And so if you already have a brain that perhaps is more sensitive and then we're kind of layering on something like a concussion, it can make recovery harder. It can make perhaps you, you're not able to just recover with whatever we tell you that is kind of brain rest and concussion recovery and therapy. Maybe we have to use medications to get you better. So any of these underlying conditions that we see that maybe there wasn't anything awful causing them, migraines, things like that, but your brain just functions a little bit differently. When you layer that concussion on top of it, it does make recovery harder. And then if that continues to happen, each, you know, successive time, then it's going to be, you know, a little bit more harder and harder. So we really have to be mindful of the choices that we're making when we see those kids. Yeah. And another thing with concussions, we've talked about numbers of concussions. I know there's no hard set number of concussions, but just as the numbers start to add up, once you have four or five, six concussions, what should we be talking about or conversations we're having with parents to just inform them so they can make a decision of, hey, is it time to stop playing sports? Yeah, it's so hard because in my experience, the children that have those are the ones that are really deeply involved in their sport. Right. Um, and so it really, you know, my discussions are if you, you know, take take yourself out of high school, right? Put yourself as an adult, kind of what what are your goals for adulthood? That could be athletic goals, that could be cognitive goals, that could be family goals, that could be mental health goals. And, you know, it's, re- it's a really hard discussion because I've had kids sitting in there that have had three, four concussions and are not at their cognitive baseline. Like admittedly, these are, you know, A, B students not functioning at an A, B level, otherwise fine. And back in the sport and another concussion and, you know, they're willing to risk it. You know, my conversation, if it's like one concussion, right, or, or one or two and you're back to your baseline, I, I will ask kids if they're not doing well, and this might be a bad barometer, but is your plan to be a professional, we'll say football player? Like, is that is that your ultimate goal? Right. And, yes. and, <laughs> well, so so some of them know, you know, they're just they just love the sport. They're still in right. it. And, and right. if it's been multiple concussions, I'm like, you should definitely get out. You should you should be done. Like if, if that's not your goal, if if you're like, no, nah, I probably can't make it to that level and we're in concussion number three or four, not worth it. Right. Because you're going to try to be doing something else. And then I think you get into some touchy issues with the kids that it is because there's different reasons that people want to continue to play. There's love of sport. There's getting out of certain situations. There's, you know, there's all sorts of other things that it's not as simple as like, we just put uh, 17 years and, you know, $37,000 into this. And, you know, we, we, we're all riding, you know, so I get all the different levels of that. But I think when people start to, it's not a simple, we're better in a, we're better in a month and you start to see the long-term effects and it's outside of just, I have a headache. It's how you're thinking. It's how you're feeling. It's how you're acting. Um, and I have have long discussions and a lot of times it's many discussions about is this serving the person that you want to be in the future not just who you are right now yeah no, i like that and it's it's really empowering the patient and the parent with the information mm-hmm. because at the end of the day we make recommendations but the parent makes the ultimate decision if they don't like the fact that you said don't play football they can change schools and find yeah. a new doctor and do whatever mm-hmm. they want to. So Absolutely. really mm-hmm. you have to empower the patient and the parent to, and that's what informed consent is about making yes. sure that you understand your risk benefits and alternatives to treatment. And then you make a decision. So mm-hmm. yeah, thank you for sharing that. Sure. And then one other question, this is for me. So as an orthopedic surgeon, we're talking about bone health all the time. So I can talk about vitamin D from a bone health standpoint, but talk Mm -hmm. about vitamin D from a neurology standpoint. Vitamin D, everybody gets a vitamin D check with me. All the people get a vitamin D check. So I did a whole week of of vitamin D. I think I called it a vitamin D deep dive. We hear about bone health and things like that, but vitamin D uh, is sometimes called a neurosteroid because it, you know, it protects the brain. It helps the brain heal. And even in, you know, to kind of bring it back to a real world situation, low vitamin D levels have been linked to making migraines worse and, and kind of cognitive worsening. And so I check vitamin D on many of people uh, sometimes kids these days are not outside as much as we would like them to be. Maybe not the athletes. They're inside. They're on their games. And so I check that a lot because I really sometimes will try to do more natural their children. So if I can give you some vitamin D supplementation or other things that go along with that, and that can improve whatever I'm seeing you for, love that as opposed to, hey, you know, we're doctors, we can give you medications, you know, but can we try to serve these children with things that are more natural that will help them feel better? 
Yeah, that's very good. And, you know, sometimes I forget, slip off the radar, really, patients that can have fractures or they'll come Mm -hmm. in just complaining of bone pain. And you know it, that this is something I should be checking, but you get caught up in the day-to-day rigors in the office and many times it'll go unchecked. And yep. sometimes when I say, hey, let's check your labs, check your vitamin D, the parents are like, really? Why are you checking that? So mm-hmm. uh, I'm That's glad the one thing because people will come with everything else checked. Everything else has right. been checked. And they're like, we've had all the labs. And I'm like, mm, yeah. you probably haven't had your vitamin D checked. And they're really surprised uh, yeah. how low that it can be. So, yeah. And African-Americans, because our skin doesn't absorb from the sun. The way exactly. That, you know, people with less mm-hmm. melanin. So. Exactly. Even more so. Yes. Well, this has been very informative for me. Uh, thank you for taking the time out to to come on. So on Time Out with the Sports Doctor, this is your final time out. So um, we talked about your social media presence. We talked mm-hmm. about, you know, kind of work-life balance and all the many things we have to juggle. So speak to a busy physician or a busy healthcare provider or whoever who say, my plate's completely full. I don't see how I could possibly do anything else. Talk about how you can really incorporate what you're doing on social media just into your day-to-day activities and really without it being just an overwhelming burden. Yeah, I think write down five things that you could talk about off the top of your head and that you could talk about for about 15 seconds. That's it. That's really to start. And you'd be surprised at how many people want to hear about that. And then you get feedback. It doesn't have to be a lot. I think in the beginning I did, I was doing really long videos and I was like, Mm -hmm. nobody wants to hear all that. You know, they want to know three things you look for in a migraine, you know, that's five seconds and and a clip. And so if we really can dial it down, it's so helpful for people. Some people don't have access, you know, they can get the internet, but they might not have cars. They might not have time to go to the doctor. They might, again, no, an internet doctor should not be your only source of kind of medical information. However, it can be a source. And if you're able to provide that information, for people around the world, uh, what a great thing that we can do. Absolutely. And tell people how they can follow you on social media or if they want to seek you out for uh, care, sure. what they can find. So I'm at uh, Wellstar Health System, which is in Georgia um, at the East Cobb Health Park location. But you can find me on Instagram and a little bit on TikTok uh, at It's the Brain for Me, completely spelled out. So I T S T H E B R A I N F O R M E. Perfect. And we'll include that information in the show notes. Uh, But once again, thank you for taking time out to come on and share your wealth of knowledge with the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace. Tuned in, trust you don't want to miss. This is where life, sports, and medicine.